I'm happy to present the next presenter. Uh, Professor Stefano Pampanin is lecturing uh, structure, structure mechanics, structure precast in, uh, at the universities in New Zealand and Italy, both uh, countries uh, very much affected by earthquakes, uh, both countries sadly recently even uh, with heavy earth earthquakes affected. He was one of the authors of the New Zealandian uh, press codes, especially for precast structures against uh, surf, um, earthquake um, loads. And I'm happy um, to give you the word, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and everyone for being here. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able uh, to share with you some latest development in the area of uh, seismic design of precast concrete structures. And uh, I will be starting showing something that should not happen uh, anymore in the future, hopefully, which is uh, a full city Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, South Island, uh, completely destroyed by the earthquake in 2011. Uh, Christchurch and New Zealand are very well developed country with very high seismic design. People are designing properly, construction is being done properly, and yet uh, we have a problem of uh, uh, completely destruction of, uh, of a city. There is no need to remind you, thanks to the presentation of the previous speaker, about the earthquake loading. And China is uh, in an area which has been discovered to be more and more seismic than what people thought in the past. I was actually quite astonished to see that the Chinese seismic map was showing a no seismic zone around Shanghai. And I'm pleased to hear from the previous speaker that actually the no seismic area has been removed. There is nothing as, as such as no seismic in countries uh, like China. So if you think, again, I don't need to remind the people, but sometimes uh, there is a problem of uh, history and, uh, and memory. Pre-76 and post-76 in China is uh, probably a threshold, is a, 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 a very important time Earthquakes has happened in China pre-76 uh, uh, with uh, 1920, hundreds of thousands of victims. Uh, 1976, a big earthquake, uh, changing the perception of the Chinese people and also the non-Chinese people about the risk. Post-76, a lot of earthquakes have been recorded uh, and the Xichuan uh, or Wenchuan, Great Wenchuan earthquakes uh, is another unfamous one. Uh, and since uh, the Chinese uh, scientific community, I would say in the last 20 years, uh, and the government has really pushing very hard uh, to develop laboratories, uh, structural uh, uh, design provisions, and so forth. So in a way, we are moving in the right directions. Uh, what I would like to try to explain here is uh, let's try not to make the same mistakes uh, that have been done in other countries around the world. What has happened in terms of development of seismic design? If you're looking at the use and development of precast concrete uh, after the 76 uh, Chinese earthquake in, uh, in China, uh, people would have said uh, no precast. After some other earthquakes in 1994 in, in uh, Northridge in uh, uh, California or 1995 in Kobe and so forth, more recently people would have said no more precast. And the idea is that precast, the pre prejudice, the main mistake in the prejudice is Precast collapse. In California, in Turkey, precast is uh, brittle. And this is just wrong, and we know it is wrong. It's not precast concrete being the problem. The problem is detailing. The problem is design. Today, we can design a seismic structure made of the most brittle material that you know, glass. We can design a structure made of glass, but we design in a way that the connection between the brittle elements are ductile. So the most brittle material can be designed to be ductile. And this something is extremely complicated to explain, but it's very simple to make a toy and show to people what it looks like. Because there was, it was a catch-22, so who comes first? People were very concerned about this behavior. People did not have rational seismic design guidelines. And the design guidelines were not being produced because people did not believe that precast concrete was actually good enough. Things changed in the 1990s. In the 1990s, things became more common. People discovered that precast can be done more appropriately using the emulation of cast-in-place concrete. So trying to simulate as much as possible what concrete 
cast in situ or cast in place looks like. But in a way, we, I will be trying to, to confirm or uh, highlight that this is yet not good enough. This is not what precast concrete can do. Precast concrete can do much more. Strong connection, which is a way to push the problem away from the connection, meaning uh, make the connection such that uh, inelastic behavior will not occur in the connection between precast elements. Uh, again, not bad, but it's not exactly what precast can do. So what I will be talking is about uh, the whole pros and cons of traditional and, and new or innovative connection. And I did, really don't like to call it new, but new is sometimes what is new for who you're talking to. Maybe it's not new for you because they are 20 years old uh, new connections, but it might be new for a precaster, for a client, for a politician. And so it is important to explain to people that precast concrete can do much better than, than this. This is an example of a precast industrial building. The operation 24-7 of this building, the business of this building is more important than the building itself. After the building has been damaged or to the extreme, that's the earthquake in 1997 in Turkey, is collapsed, the lack of operation, so the downtime, is so expensive that you'll be thinking about investing in a better structural design to avoid that downtime. If you're looking at some fundamental aspects, aspects uh, in uh, seismic, uh, sorry, mistake, uh, design of precast concrete buildings, uh, somehow are almost obvious. And so the presentation from yesterday and today um, are summarizing basically what we should be knowing. It's about design methodology, the appropriate design methodology. You can use a force-based design, which is in every code in the world, assuming your elastic period taking the, uh, the uh, acceleration from the code and then design for the forces, the problem is to assume the right period, not just uh, the one that is coming from a formula. Or you can do a displacement-based design, and some people for you would say what it is, is something uh, which since uh, 20 years ago has been properly developed uh, by Nigel Priestley, ex uh, uh, Canterbury University, so a uh, New Zealander going to California, and then a big team around the world has been working on something which is a better way of doing things. But also it's about understanding uh, building behavior, and we have a problem over here. If we think about precast being uh, almost equal to cast in place concrete, uh, we are not using it properly. Precast is behaving differently than cast in situ concrete. We should not be trying to emulate, uh, otherwise we're going to just get the wrong uh, approach. We should be thinking precast in, in a precast sense. Structural systems, the diaphragm, the no structural elements, the foundation, the whole building system should be conceived as a, as a, uh, 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 as a whole, altogether. Connection details, the connections are the critical path, critical part of the load path. And so it is fundamental to understand how the connection detailing should be done properly. Otherwise, without a proper design methodology, without understanding of the behavior of the building, and without detailing, we don't get it right. More so, we have been discussing about the redundancy and the robustness. There is a prejudice about precast concrete not being robust, precast concrete possibly not being redundant. It's ab absolutely based on your design. You can do a uh, proper, a robust, and redundant, uh, there was presentation from the model code, uh, from the FIB precast uh, handbook, uh, that can show you how you can do robustness, design ro for robustness or, or, or redundancy in any case. But there's a lot of issues which are not typically of precast, are typically of reinforced concrete, or typically of steel, which is incompatibility. A building is made of structural system, frames, walls, diaphragm, dress, which is the envelope. All of them should move compatibly. And this is something that we are discovering in recent earthquakes, uh, which we are not good at doing. It's not a problem precast, but precast can give us very good suggestions of how easier it is to see that movement, uh, relative movement between the different elements. And lastly, which means first, detailing, detailing, detailing. The devil is in the detail. People cannot ignore how fundamental is detailing. An old say from Tom Pauly, the legend of earthquake engineering from New Zealand was a structure will survive because of detailing, not because of the reduction factor that you'll be using, not because of the forces that you've been using, but because of proper detailing, which will not allow the structure to collapse locally and so globally. 
Let's look at different options that uh, we have available as designer, construction, precaster, according to codes around the world. One of the first ones that has been the most traditional one, at least in Europe, is about what we call hinge connections, which are typical of precast industrial building in Europe. This is a typical uh, snapshot of what a precast industrial building in uh, some parts of Europe predominantly would have looked like, where you have a socket foundation, you have a multi-story multi precast columns with a big corbel. Beams will be sitting on the corbel either with nothing, pre-70, or with dowels, vertical bars, post-70s. And then you have a multiple type of flooring system and multiple type of roof beams. This system is extremely good to take advantage of precast from the point of view of speed of erection, from the point of view of quality control, and so forth. It's not probably the best to take, take care of the lateral movement that the earthquake will be providing. When you go to a multi-story, you want to go for open space, so you can apply the same prob the same skeleton, but as been shown by previous speakers, uh, the problem of uh, columns, which are basically working as a cantilever only, without moment-resisting connection, is movement displacement. So you need to have a core wall. You need to have a seismic resisting system. But be careful, because you can have a, a core lift shaft or a core wall, but then you have to have a diaphragm able to transfer all the forces into the core wall. And people tend to forget that the whole system needs to be working together, and they tend to forget that as soon as you displace this element, the P axial load multiplied by the displacement becomes a big deal for that type of system. Typical connection using this dry approach, not moment resisting, is uh, are using cleats uh, from roof beam uh, to, to beam uh, or dowels uh, or vertical dowels between beam and column. And this is typically the only moment resisting connection of such a structural system. At the base, uh, the column goes into a socket foundation and due to basically the restraint that you get, uh, you have a moment resistant. Honestly, in 2017, we should be looking at this as bad has been done properly, but is there are much better way to have a moment-resisting connection between a column and a beam, for example, using starter bars, grouted sleeves, mechanical couplers, uh, something that we can really rely upon to have a moment-resisting connection. Other typical solutions, uh, which are absolutely allowed uh, and they are working okay, there's not probably the best way for a lateral resistance, but they're working okay, are being shown over here where beams are coming into a column and they're using again dowel. These are not moment resisting connection. These are hinged. So all the lateral resistance is taken from the foundation connection. So what is the problem or the advantages? Let's look at the advantages. Let's try to be positive over here. The advantage is by doing so, you are actually doing precast. It's quality control, sp speed of erection, fast, dry, excellent. Problem or limit. The scheme, the static scheme, the system is not a moment-resisting frame. It's actually a, a summary of cantilever schemes. So if you really want to improve the seismic capacity, you should be trying to do the most obvious things, which is moment-resisting connection. So three points. Great because it's dry, is fast to erect, problem because in a way it's not a moment-resisting. So let's go and see how we can improve this uh, structural scheme from a not so efficient to something more efficient. And already in China, people are doing what uh, in everywhere in the world has been done, which is trying to emulate cast in place. But somehow we are taking uh, off some limitation, but we are going backwards. We are improving in a way, and we are going backwards for other ways. Why we are uh, improving and going backwards at the same time? Because eventually, this type of emulation of casting place, uh, this is ex-Soviet uh, uh, Union, so already the east part of Europe, uh, uh, let's say Russia, Ukraine, Balkanic area, was using uh, since ages this type of connection where precast elements are almost fully prefabricated, but they are then connected in the joint uh, by using wet connection. What is the benefit? It's a moment-resisting connection. What is the limitation? is not as fast as precast concrete could look like. 
These are examples coming from New Zealand and Japan, widely adopted. The black is precast and the white is cast in situ. And you know the problem. You can have different type of configuration. The problem is speed. You are actually slowing down and you have a congestion of the joint. It's itself a very good way of providing moment resistance. Excellent, but, but, but. You have other problems. And similarly, there are many other ways of doing this sort of emulation cast in place approach. In Italy, as an example, so I, I would like to tell you this story to say to the Chinese friends, don't do the same, make the same mistake. In Italy, this tried to be imported in 1990s. So we had a solution. We had a solution which were semi precast and then precasted. Look at those beams U shaped beams, shell beams, which semi precasted. The solution was very good, but the solution was not taken up by the market. Why? Cost. It seems to be the same story in China. Too much expensive because in Italy, people were doing cast in place concrete. Because at that time in Italy, the cost per hour of a contractor, construction person, were cheap. There was no way to compete between this type of precast and cast in place concrete. Slowly and slowly in Italy, like in other countries, the per hour construction cost increased. And this is where precast can do better, but not this precast, because this is not yet precast. So you have to really do precast properly to be able to get to the next level up. In the recent FIB bulletin number 78, which has been published in 2016, you will find some detailing which are showing basically how you could, in different type of system, have a column, beams are coming on the top of the column and typically are sitting are sitting on a, on a little edge, and then uh, you are going to grout and cast around the connection. So you need to, first of all, support the columns. The slabs is coming, uh, and check this. You need to support a bit the slab, nothing major. And then over here, you're preparing the new reinforcement. Uh, and after you prepare the new reinforcement, reinforcement, you can grout. It's quite fast, but it's not fully precast. But it is very good. But, but, okay? We are saying it is very good. We are just saying that you can do better. This is another very good system where you have a shell beam sitting on the corbel, sitting on, sorry, not a corbel, but on the column, and then you're sliding in. The reinforcing is being moved by hand into the joint, and then you're preparing the slab, and then you're casting the slab very fast. And these are examples of solutions that in Italy, the same place where 30 years ago people did not want to use precast, is coming back because these are becoming quite fast. So you have columns, the corbels are very small, the beams are sitting on the corbels, and then when you cast the floor, you cast the floor and the joint, and these are becoming definitely good ways of doing precasting. And you can see here the, sh the beams, shell beams, semi precasted, and then you're sliding the reinforcement into the joint before casting. What is of issue of some of these solutions? It was mentioned already by the Chinese, uh, China State uh, uh, construction person. You need to make sure that precast, precast, and concrete, the new concrete, uh, is actually working together. So you need to prepare the surface, roughening, or preparing shear keys. I can tell you by having done quite a few tests, uh, also in checking literature, it's very hard to make uh, this construction becoming one joint. You have an old concrete, then you have a new concrete. You can prepare a shear key, and more likely you're going to break, create a crack at this level over here. So it's not exactly what the theory suggests, but let's say it is allowed. This is another example where you have a minimum or no propping required if uh, instead of sitting uh, the beam onto the column, which will require propping because you're sitting on a small portion of the column on a covered concrete, you can go back to the precast uh, big corbel or less big corbel, and this will require less propping. Pros and cons, the corbel is not the best, but you can make it smaller or you can use some uh, type of other solutions. But the, con the pros, uh, the, the, the positive is that you can use this, this is in Turkey, for solutions which are very similar to what you've done yesterday, and almost, almost looks fully precast. This is becoming closer to be fast uh, precast. Look at the, the first obvious thing is columns all the way up, 
as long as you can transport them. Beams, uh, these are from one span to the other, but you try to push uh, as much as you can the columns apart, uh, and if you could, uh, you try to pre-stress the beam. So the beam can stay simply supported for maybe eight meter span, and then later on you're going to cast on the top. Columns very long, uh, already lifted up, uh, and these are different detailing, and then when you go to the final solutions, uh, these can accommodate the beam, and you're casting around. Is not fully precast, but it's close to, it's close to. Something that which I still like a lot uh, is the concept of using double cruciform joints. Why? Each single connection, wet connection, costs a lot of money, costs time. So you need to try to minimize the type of connections. So to minimize the type of connection, you can make a cruciform, two, two times cruciform joint, where these and those will be the only slowing down process of your prefabrication. And so it's a matter of crane, crane power. You can lift up big frames, and if you do so, you're really replicating what the previous speaker was showing about steel. Big element, big sub-assemblies, not modular, one bay, one con, one story, otherwise it's going to be too expensive. So the most obvious learning from here is don't divide your L-beam, your building, into small Lego elements. If you have a lot of Lego elements to connect together, it's going to be very expensive if you're using emulation of casting plates. But you're, if you're preparing super assembly, you're going to pay for a larger crane, but you're going to pay less for cost and time. So what you can do in a different other system, you can have not only a beam going from one bay to the other, but you can have a multi-span beam, a, mo a, mo a beam which is spanning for multiple uh, uh, units and sitting uh, on, on columns. Here you're going to do the other way. The beam comes, sits on the column, and then you're grouting. And this type of solution has been adopted, for example, in New Zealand, uh, in a number of buildings, uh, where uh, you can go as fast as you need. Uh, if you can prepare, these are actually short beams, uh, but you see before casting, before casting, and then later on after casting. Relatively fast. Not yet as fast as you wish, but relatively fast. Other solutions where we are using here a uh, beam sitting on the edge of the, of the column, and this is casted in. So this is a typical emulation of casting place approach. What is the problem over here? You can see the benefit, but the problem is that look at the story height, 4 meters, 3.6. Look at the bay length, 4 meters. You don't want to use precast for 4 meters. It doesn't make any sense. If you, it's like having a, a cable stay bridge on a creek long five meters. If you want to use a cable stay bridge, you use it for a long span. If you want to use a suspended bridge or a pre-stressed bridge when compared to a cast in situ bridge, you need to go longer. That's where you get the advantage. So using a precast and not taking advantage of the span length is itself a mistake. It means that you're not taking advantage of the number of gears of your Ferrari car. You have a Ferrari, has seven gears, and you like to go on one gear. Why did you buy a Ferrari for one gear? The one gear of this Ferrari is still so fast that you can feel some advantages, but you're just not exploiting the advantages of precast concrete. Emulation again. Another good way is actually to take the cruciform, which is complicated when it's vertical, horizontal. This is very smart. If you do it horizontally, it's much faster to actually put that in position. It comes much faster the way to keep it uh, uh, right in terms of uh, horizontal leveling. And it's quite simple to make uh, the connection. Again, the problem is uh, the length from here to there. I would like to have uh, this column, take it off, next column. This is what precast should be doing. Not emulating uh, the architecture feature of casting place concrete. And you can see here from the top view, these are the feet. This is a shell beam which is connected at the, at the interface with the column with mechanical coupler, and then you cast the topping of the floor onto the connection, so rel relatively fast. 
Now let's look at the limitation. Now we have a moment resisting capacity, which is absolutely great from seismic resistance. But what is the limitation? It's not precast concrete. It's not what precast concrete should look like. It's not exploiting the peculiarities, the advantages of precast concrete. It's actually slowing down the erection speed when compared to real precast concrete, which means cost. It also requires some complexity of the connection. These connections are too complicated. You have to do many different molds to prepare different beams and columns, so you're actually paying more. So I'm not surprised to hear that in China you're complaining that precast concrete is expensive because you're, this is not precast concrete. This is a, a little brother of what precast concrete can be. If you're actually talking to the big brother, you're going to have a less cost. So there is another problem now, which honestly we didn't know. We didn't know, we've been talking about that as uh, researchers. You emulate concrete, you get concrete. And concrete will, will give you ductility, which means damage. And people until a few years ago would have said it's part of the deal. In earthquake engineering, you concentrate the damage in the plastic hinges, that's what we can do. I'm sorry, we can do much better. So let's not just accept that ductility means damage. Let's go to New Zealand. Now from Italy, we moved from China to Italy, back to New Zealand, not forgetting the other ones, Japan and the States. So big country, big seismic country, big earthquake in 2010-11, which has been really creating a disaster. That's the city of Christchurch. During the earthquake of February, this is a picture taken from the hills when the city is being destroyed by the earthquake. These are buildings, reinforced concrete buildings. You can call them precast concrete. In New Zealand, they are doing very well concrete. The concrete is about concrete. Can be precast, can be cast in situ, can be pre-stressed, can be post-tension. There is no difference between the two. And in this case, as part of a 1960 type of design, the columns are very weak, the beams are very strong, so it's naturally a soft story, but there was a wall, and the wall was meant to be the core wall. It did not work very properly because the earthquake was stronger than the design. So what are issues of these type of solutions? Design methodology assumption, they were not in 1960 using the proper hierarchy of strength or capacity design that we know today. Big column, weak beam. They were doing the other way around. Weak column, strong beam. So the design was itself wrong. They didn't know it because they did not know obviously what they did not know. But also lack of redundancy because the system itself relies upon one wall. There's no redundancy apart from that wall. If the wall cannot take a bigger than design earthquake, you have a collapse system. And then detailing. I start from the back. Detailing, redundancy, I think. This is the one that is killing the system. There are issues on this building which uh, were not uh, allowing the system to survive. 1980, very well designed, precast, bad detailing. I start from the back, bad detailing. The beams into the column did not have enough length of the rebars developing into the beam column joint. I don't go into the details. The diaphragm was not connected very properly to the main shear wall. So this big shear tower did not work, was not activated because the diaphragm was not able to deliver the forces and so they broke. It failed the diaphragm and the diaphragm went around and everything collapsed. So big problem of design methodology, capacity design, assumption, redundancy, detailing. Let's go from the, from the last, from the, from the first point, detailing. If this detailing had been done properly, we would not have this collapse. This is a big, big, uh, big example of one of the best uh, emulation of casting place approach that we've been actually using uh, since quite a number of years. Uh, Built in 1980s, this building is a 22-story building. Frames in both directions, look at the emulation of casting place, very well done. Typically, I use that to show that uh, it takes time to do emulation of casting place. If you call precast, and you need to have a crane, one, two, three, four, five, six people just watching the setting of one pin column joint, this is not precast. This is okay, but it's not what precast can do. And then you're going to say it's expensive, of course. Unless these people are your friends and you, you pay them nothing, of course it is expensive. And so we need to move the next step up. This is a brilliant example 
of a textbook of seismic design. The earthquake uh, hit the building. The building did brilliantly, brilliantly, like a textbook, formed a beam column, uh, uh, plastic hinge in the, in the beam to column connection, so in the beam. The columns were absolutely okay. Nothing happened in the columns, but the building was not repairable. So there is a problem over here. There's a big problem. Are we actually trying to develop a system which is expensive and costs more than the, the casting C2 concrete? And is delivering the same problem of casting C2 concrete, uh, being uh, the knowledge of today, we need to demolish this building uh, because we don't know how to repair it. Uh. Precast concrete can do much more. And it's not only precast concrete, it's any technology can do much more. Half of the building uh, in Christchurch, in the financial district, uh, we are talking about 1,600 uh, or 1,800 buildings, 1,800 buildings were demolished because people did not, did not know how to repair them. That's the city. Just look at any of these buildings. Focus on whatever. I do it again. Just pick up one. This is actually not yet finished. This is the, the city completely taken down. These were buildings, and now it's sand. It looks like a desert city. Instead of constructing a city in the desert, it was deconstructed. 25% of the GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, was the cost of this earthquake. Why the, uh, New Zealand is not in bankrupt? Because there was a reinsurance uh, paying uh, for most of this cost. So quite a unique situation, which you don't have in China, we don't have in Italy, in California is not there. So basically, it's a problem of big cost for the country, and we need to do it in a different way. So let's see if we can put together the lessons learned so far. Dry connections are great. But if they are connected with a hinged connection, it's not good enough. We would like to have moment-resistant connection. Moment-resistant connection can be done if we try to emulate cast-in-place concrete, but we don't have a dry connection. So can we have a moment-resistant connection which is actually dry and ductile? And you will be thinking, yes, that's a dream wish list. Actually, it's been already done. So let's see what we have in terms of billings. This is the reality that we have to explain to our client when we do cast-in-place concrete or typical steel. Any typical construction will suffer damage anywhere. In the structure system, in the partitions, in the floor, in the uh, 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 infill or external facades, and this will be the real, the real problem of our building. So how could we get the best out of the best system and make them together. We would like to have a moment-resisting connection, which is dry and is like ductile. Back in the 90s, something has already been done, so for all of us, and we will be kept on working on it. There is a 39-story building in San Francisco, which is using what I will be calling now this technology. It's not anymore a new technology, because it's been there for a while. And the, where did it start? It started from the states, University of California, San Diego, but really all uh, the states were developing new solutions uh, under the coordination of Professor Nigel Priestley to try to find a better way of doing precast concrete in seismic region. And it came up that a better way is to use precast in a dry way, connected together by something magic. What is something magic is the most obvious thing uh, that you'll be doing uh, if you were thinking uh, as a Lego with a kid. This is post-tensioning. If you think about precast bridges, precast bridges are made of uh, box girder, which are pre-stressed, and they are post-tensioned against each other, right? So you can do the same in a building. This is a precast beam, which is connected to the column by post-tensioning. The important part is the post-tensioning should not be bonded, should be unbonded. Why? Because if it's not bonded, you are able to have an elastic spring to bring back the building after the earthquake. This is moving back and forth, and the elastic spring made of the post-tensioning brings you back. So that's what we have until yesterday. A building which goes until, uh, through the earthquake, emulation of casting place concrete, and you get that, and at the end of the day, you say, I'm happy. Your client will not be happy. No, the community will not be happy because this means uh, demolition. So we would like to have something which uh, makes like that, opens up, close back, opens up, close back, no damage. And it's actually able to dissipate the energy. At the end of the earthquake, you have uh, no residual deformation. The building is straight. This building will be damaged and not be straight. 
Where does it come from? From the, our ancestors. They already have that technology. They already had uh, blocks, 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 blocks of, of marble working against each other. What they did not have is post tensioning. They did not think about having a cable connecting the marble blocks uh, to go to take uh, the effect of the earthquake. So you take the technology from 2,500 years ago, you re engineer with uh, post tensioning, and that's what you get precast, precast, dry fast, post-tensioning dry, and the rebars are nothing else than the typical start rebars coming from the foundation, which will be grouted to give you the moment resisting connection. Something that we developed further because we were not happy to slow down the process with this internal rebar, and we were not happy to have damage of the rebar inside, we moved this rebar outside. So now the moment resisting connection at this level is made by the post-tensioning and is made by the steel which is outside so you can plug and play. That's why we call it plug and play. After the earthquake, these are the sacrificial fuses. They are developed as fuses. They're going to de be damaged over here and you take them off and you re-plug in. This is precast. You can do it fast and quick uh, in a connection. Just a detailing of what these uh, External reinforcement looks like, but let's think that we are not technical engineers, so we are not uh, actually technical people at all. We are simply going to tell to, to people that they can find in the supermarket, uh, of, uh, of the normal supermarket, an extra small or a medium or an extra large plug and play, which are going to be 10, 20 kilonewton, 40, 50 kilonewton, in the same way that uh, you would be able to change the light bulb. You don't need to be an electrical engineer to change a light bulb. You need to know it's, uh, whether it's a 5 watt, 30 watt, 60 watt, and only one thing, the connection. In our case, we are saying one connection. We are going to use exactly the same connection so people cannot make a mistake. And you can use uh, a typical uh, piece of steel inside here with a fuse. This can become something more sophisticated, like, for example, a viscous damper. So it can be something absolutely available from any company producing devices, or you make your own. So, different type of architecture configuration. Now this is precast. Precast, precast, connection. Precast, precast, connection. And column to foundation. This is a beam, column, beam, column, connection to foundation and, and a wall. Now, you will be wondering, thank you, but our code will not allow us. It's the typical answer that engineers will say, once you get the point, First of all, how many engineers in the room? How many contractor? Construction? Architects? Everyone else? Okay. So they, you will be asking for what our Chinese code does not allow to do so. Even the American code, the U European code, the New Zealand code do not allow because the code is written by people not by whoever else, it's written by people. So it's a matter of explaining that already in the 2004, the FIB had a document uh, which was showing uh, what can be done using different type of solutions, including emulation of casting plates, including a post-tensioning technique. 12 years later, more has been prepared within the FIB documents. It's not a code, but it's a guideline about detaining. So you can actually have more information. But you want to have a code. I give you a code. 2006, the New Zealand Guidelines for Concrete, NZS 3101 is the concrete code in New Zealand, is specifically addressing what we call joint ductile connection, and is specifically addressing the possibility to use either a force-based design, which is a common everywhere in the world, or a more developed displacement-based design. So at that time, there was a lot of that we were doing, and people said, okay, now I have a code, but I don't know how, engineers are very demanding. And they said, I don't know how to design, because the code doesn't say how. It says that I can, but it doesn't really go step by step. So through the Concrete Society in New Zealand, we prepared a full design and book, which is available. We are going to discuss about having a Chinese translation, but apparently it has already been done uh, unofficially. So it's available for you somehow, I don't know how. And it's about taking a building, showing step by step the full design procedure and detailing. And the engineers have actually learned in New Zealand about how to do it. And they have been 
from theory, they've been actually doing it. Now, there is a number of slides here, fast and quick, which are going to show what has been done around the world. States, United States, 39-story building is still the highest one, highest building using this technology and using specifically the post-tensioning and the steel is inside. This is the original version, steel is inside. If you want to do the highest building in the world using this technology, you simply have to go to 40 story, make it 41. Italy, plenty of this solution. I've been involved in some of them, actually in all of this, uh, this, te this type, of, because we developed in the lab, and this is actually using the concept of a bridge, where the cable are not straight, they can be parabolic. You can go for a very long span, 12 meters, 12 by 10. Your architect will become your friend. Your client will become your friend because it's fast and quick and it costs less because it's fast and quick. Precast, corbel hidden, there's a steel corbel being hidden. You can find them from producer. Column multi-story, the, 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 the uh, floor system comes, apart, comes on the top and you make it very fast. Argentina, there was a building for a, hosp sorry, for a, a hotel that needed to be completed before the winter season and precast was the way to go, otherwise it would have been too slow. They went for precast, they went fast, they, went, they, got, they gained a winter season. It got completed by time. Costa Rica. Costa Rica has done a lot. They are really well developing uh, precast concrete using post-tensioning for both frames. You see here the post-tensioning of the column against the beam, both frames and walls. And they've been sending students, both to Italy where we were teaching the courses, or to New Zealand to know more. New Zealand, we were amongst the latest. We could use the latest technology, and the latest technology was not only using post-tensioning walls, but also using plug and plays. These are the plug and play, then they can be uh, uh, painted, and uh, you can have them in the beam to column connection, and you can have them, you can see over there, at the column to foundation. This is the construction site. You see no propping, no support clean. The construction company said for them was fundamental to have a very neat and clean construction site without uh, any interference of different propping. The, the column is almost uh, self-standing. The beams comes without any support. The floors, double T's in this case, or all of core comes uh, without any further support. Uh, so you have a fast construction practice. And these can be then painted uh, as you wish and the architects would be very happy to show them. These are actually shown in the building, in specifically location in the caf cafeteria, it's a university building, uh, where people can show them. The second building is actually one of the most interesting because you went through the big earthquake in Christchurch. So this building was prepared for a hospital and there were both walls, post tension, and coupled and, fr and, and frames. And the frames, uh, completely different construction company, they were very conservative, too much conservative. So they wanted to have uh, a corbel, all type, and we had to design following the construction company. So as an engineer, the benefit of having a family of solutions is that you can mix and match to suit, suit to, to, to be specifically the best solution for your client, for your contractor. Different client and different contractor, different projects can require something else. Very similar to what George was mentioning before about tall buildings. You need to try to find a, a kit. And the kit over here was to go a bit backwards with a beam which is not fully precast, but it was cheaper for them. And then you're going to cast the beam on the top. You can see over here the column, beams coming over, all the core coming on the top. And then these are the walls after the earthquake. These went through the earthquake. The 2010, 2011, the all earthquake sequence, the city close by was literally destroyed, and this building had such a damage. People had to go there and find the damage, and because it did actually what it was meant to do. So it was a hospital, it was operational, and this became a big news. It went on all the news, people saying, what's going on? What is that thing that is actually capable of taking a building? Certainly, it would be very expensive. Certainly, it would have been designed as a bunker. So they went to interview different people. I was not allowed to give the numbers because uh, you have a confidentiality agreement with the client. So they interviewed me, the other designer, and the client. But they interviewed all of us at the same time. So 
people could not see what the other one has said. So I did say, I'm not allowed to tell you the number, but the building did not, I, I used a negative, double negative. The building did not cost more than a traditional solution. As per se, it costs less. I can't give you the number. Then uh, the engineer gave the number. He said the building cost a lot less because we saved such and such in the foundation, in the construction, in time. The client was the CEO, the uh, uh, chief executive officer of the, of the hospital. And he said, he didn't know what we said. And so he said in the interview, we take care of the uh, safety of our patient. So we invested a lot of money to make it happen. It's not true. He, the, 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 the instruction were either it's cheaper or I don't want to use this solution. So we had to prove it was cheaper. So please trust that a lot of people are using this building for one reason, they're cheaper. And also they're better. But if, it, if they were only better, people they would, would not buy it. So what we can, can convey to you is, if you then work on different te technology, then the police, uh, police wants a building, and they want to have uh, 2014 a building which is top notch, and they're asking for base isolation. Base isolation was uh, not that easy for a number of issues with the geothermal consideration of the soil. And this was so much honestly fun. Because, of course, I love the plug and play because uh, having invented them and they're free of charge. You can use them. I shouldn't say, but they are, they are, they are free of charge, almost. Uh, you need to know what to do, you're doing. The client really wanted to have so many. Why? Because they say, we are the police. We want to have many of these dissipators. It's not a mat matter of how many you have. It's a matter of we can hide them. In the middle of the corridor, you want, they wanted to show that the police is protecting people. So it's actually changing completely the way of doing it. Okay, now we're going to, with three videos, I'm finishing. The idea is we don't want to only do something which is the old way of doing emulation of casting place concrete, which will mean damage and not uh, repairable. We would like to do a different way which is going to be, by the way, cheaper. Most important part for a client, but much better. So we have been, after 15 years, developing a package of a building, which is not only the skeleton. It's fundamental to have the partitions, the ceilings, the whole non-structural component as a dress working properly for seismic. It's fundamental to make it happen. So I'm going to show you a few videos, if you can start the first one. This is the skeleton of the two-story building, video one. Beam against the column, this is the post tensioning, and top and bottom you have the dissipators. We were running literally 100 earthquakes before allowing the media, the television, to come to the laboratory. We said, You're bringing bad luck, we don't allow you to come in, we want to do all the research that we need to do. And we were going back and forth, back and forth with every earthquake, any earthquake without uh, basically damaging whatsoever the skeleton. So when they came in, the, 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 uh, you can go to the next uh, video too, which would be a Zoom. When the, the media came in, they did not believe it, so we were asking them, just uh, wish, this is the connection between the beam and the column. You see how much movement is happening? And these are the dissipator. The safe movement will be physically in the emulation of casting place concrete, uh, be a number of cracks. The sum of which gives you exactly that movement. It will be very, very damaged. The equivalent emulative solution is very damaged. What this is, is nothing else than the Greek temple. It's the Greek temple. It's not marble. It's less uh, expensive than marble. It's concrete. Against concrete, with the plug-and-play dissipators, so the fuses have been used. Can you go to the uh, video three? Thank you. And this is now the full thing. Because skeleton is too easy, these are precast facades and partitions included with detailing, which is always about detailing, which can go to the design level of earthquake without a single crack. Typically, a partition will suffer, will break at around, let's talk about drift, which is displacement divided by height. It's going to break at around 0.2, 0 0.3% of drift. We are able to go here until 2% of drift, which is a design level, without having a single non-structural element crack. And now I'm finishing with one slide, which is going to, it's coming. Okay, now you're going to ask how much does it cost? I already told you, but let's try to explain why. Why something new can cost less. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Wow, that was a massive, massive 
mobile phone and then the one that we have today. How much do you think, divided by your salary, that costed when compared to that, when compared to that? Everyone has one of those. So the technology, the progress made such that much better performance cost to us much less, right? We do the same thing. Do you remember that? My gosh, the first computer, which became something you will never, never work today if I pay you hundreds of dollars asking you to go home and work on this, would you do it? 1984 IBM? Would you actually use it? No way. Why? Because you know that it doesn't work. 1980. Today you're going to work on that. How much does it cost? Much less. Obviously. Obviously. Today, this is much more affordable than that and than that. Would you? Why? Why? We would. Pre-70, the buildings which are collapsing because they are designed not according to modern codes. Modern codes, 2004, New Zealand, the plastic hinge, now we know that it's going to be a problem. It's going to require demolition or repairability cost. And we have something that you've seen. Let me say, let me say that for the sake of the example, if this costs something and that doesn't cost any more, let's suppose that they are equal, would you buy this? I wouldn't. Would you buy the old way when you can buy the new way, which is precast? It does not have to be post tension. It's really precast. Now, what is the problem of why we are not doing it? Because people are doing publicity on television on those things. And there is no one doing publicity on television. But there is an exception. In New Zealand, the New Zealand government discussed in television invested money to tell to people about the new technology. In China, I think you can do the same. You can ask to your representative to invest on television, not to say precast, but to show the solution. It's not about talking about computers. It's about talking about which technology of the computers you should be using. And with that, I'm finishing thanking so many people that have been helping through the earthquakes in New Zealand, around the world. We got a lot of people, including a Chinese a delegation coming over. So it's been a great thank you for all this uh, and for your attention uh, during uh, this presentation. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, you are saying uh, there is not enough promotion for this kind of uh, technology, but I think you are the best promoter that is uh, available. So are there any questions uh, to the speaker? It's, it's, uh, let me ask a question. It's, uh, can you give a percentage of the use of these uh, um, plug and plays in the new reconstruction uh, area of Christchurch? Excellent question. The, once uh, people got the point of low damage, we call them low damage technologies, which can be made of concrete, but also steel and also timber. Then they're using, uh, without thinking about the material, whatever it takes. So in the new reconstruction, between base isolation, dissipation devices, and this thing, uh, there will be probably a, more than half of the buildings uh, being using. The plug and play are being used uh, also by the steel people a lot. Actually, more by the steel people than by the concrete people. But for another reason, that after the, conf, conc, the excuse me, the building, uh, the earthquake in Christchurch, uh, precast concrete, uh, in general concrete, uh, w was not seen as a good guy. Still, uh, for some reason, there were not enough steel buildings. Uh, so people saw a lot of concrete buildings being damaged, but not enough concrete steel buildings being damaged. So they thought, concrete is bad, steel is good. So now they're using steel and they're taking, literally taking, solutions developed for concrete into the steel environment. And so asking from a structural design point of view, are you doing basically just a straight calculation of the building without any earthquake loads and then just add them on? Or do you still have a special earthquake design? Special earthquake design. Uh, but to say how, it's one thing, uh, the methodologies of designing are becoming simpler and simpler, which doesn't mean less accurate. But it's something that uh, a student, uh, if you don't know what you don't know, it's complicated. Once we are, or, we are organizing courses where we are getting students, uh, literally half the room is students, half the room are engineers, and the engineers are suddenly saying, wow, is that, that, that is, it's so easy? I didn't know. And so basically it's becoming, uh, all those buildings have been designed by previous students of mine who went into the industry, five years old, ten years old, they managed to convince uh, their own boss, uh, and the boss came to the courses understanding uh, how simple it was, 
And when it is, when you say simple, think about controllable. As a designer, you want to understand the behavior better than having a complex and unclear uh, uh, material. So you can actually focus your design somewhere. Thank you, Stefano. If there are no more questions, uh, oh, there is one question. Yeah. Mr. Lee. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Wait, uh, hello. Uh, you know, um, Professor uh, Stefano Pampani is uh, my friend. Yeah, uh, it's the second time you have the presentation. Uh, you know, um, in uh, what you uh, pretend mentioned, uh, the duck, uh, duck tile, the, for the traditional duck tile is damaged. And you, the new generation uh, system, uh, I think it's, it's very, uh, uh, very good, very exciting, and very, um, uh, very good. Uh, my question is, uh, in this system, uh, you, you, we use the uh, post tension, the unbounded tendons. In, in China, you know the Chinese code, uh, there are some requirements about the uh, progressing collapse. Uh, yes. for, for this new uh, system, new generation of system, if, uh, uh, if there is a possible, as an engineer, the um, post tension on bond tendons may be uh, broken. Um, um, or, um, this, is, uh, this possible is very, uh, very, very small. But I think if this happened, <laughs> how to uh, deal with it? Uh, yeah, thank thank you. you. Very good question. So, in the development, uh, now I would be saying that uh, we can, when I say that we can design for redundancy, it is true, and I give you an example. If you design post-tensioning only, and you have a friction interface, uh, there is no redundancy. But what we are doing is three level of defense. The post-tensioning gives you the moment. The steel gives you moment and sh double action. And then we have a corbel. So flexure is taken by the post-tensioning and the steel. And it would be very unlikely in the, uh, the worst combination is fire after earthquake, uh, very unlikely that you break both the tendons uh, and the dissipators. Even in that case, uh, you still have a corbel. Collapse happens when you do not have load bearing capacity. So the corbel, hidden and protected by fire, would be the last resource. So we have three mechanisms. Let's go back to concrete or emulation of cast in place concrete. A plastic engine concrete develops opening cracks. There are only one type of rebars, which are giving you flexure, are giving you double action. When the cracks are opening very much, there's no more shear. So, and fire is a problem for post-earthquake. So in cast-in-place concrete or emulation cast-in-place concrete, the typical connection has no redundancy. Thank you, thank you. But I think the uh, increment of the stress of, of our boundary tendency is, is very low, even uh, under the High seismic role. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I assume that we, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, for uh, the other people, mm. because the tendons are, ve are unbonded, the strain is far away from yielding, uh, even under the maximum credible earthquake. But I really wanted to assume, uh, to make the worst case scenario, that something happened that cannot be predicted, uh, and you're losing tendons and rebars. The, the beam would be sitting on a corbel, while in reinforced concrete, uh, you only have one type of reinforcement that would be much worse. So it's a relative relatively higher safety when compared to traditional solution. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Pin. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, I have a small question. It's not a question, I guess. Uh, you didn't uh, tell us the, uh, the flaws for your yes. new system. Yes. So what's the connection yeah. uh, between the floor uh, and then the beam and then the column? Okay, excellent. Yes. That's, a, that's a part of the development. Uh, it's, it can be in a paper. It was too complicated to mention. The floor system has to follow the same movement uh, of the lateral resistance system. So what I was mentioning about being displacement incompatibility belongs to concrete as well as precast concrete. Also, these, these uh, post-tension rocking systems have issues of displacement compatibility, but to a lesser extent. Well, what we've been working on is a flooring system which have the same locally po possibility to move. So the bars are unbonded, slowly. The connection detailing is such that the floor can 
move a bit without breaking. So it is all part of the development. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, okay, thank you, Stefano. Thank you very much for the very, very nice uh, presentation.